The Volvo V90 Cross Country is today in Auto Gefühl, your number one resource for in-depth car reviews and your number one community to discuss cars today with Thomas. Exterior, especially with this crossover look, what have they changed for this version? Interior and the driving experience today. Of course, full HD, full screen and full length. Let's go! The Volvo V90 or S90 features different front grills depending on the trim level. For example, you know the inscription with those vertical chrome fins, the R design with those black dots. And here they also picked a special cross country grill, which has some crossover effect. Also the lower bumper is brighter here and has more off-road feeling. And also here equipped with the Thor's Hammer daytime running light here to symbolize it even better when I put the turning indicators on. Overall, a very strong front, and I think it works that they have introduced this crossover style. The only thing, you know, the hood doesn't go to the all to the front to bring down the uh, crash or insurance costs. It has an advantage for the customer, but design-wise, of course, it would look better if the hood would go to the very front. But I think, you know, it's not really a bad solution. Overall, I really like it. What about you? 4 meters 96 or 16 foot 3 is the total length. It's the same for all S90, V90, V90 cross country. Visually, the change is here that we got those plastic bumpers to create the off road look. But they have a little matte gray black mix style. So I think it really works with the vehicle. It really fits. And you know, there's also a lot of competition. Meanwhile, there's the Audi A6 all road. There's this. Mercedes E-Class all-terrain, for example, in uh, the, the rims, either 18 or 19 inch in this so-called Pro trim level, or also the standard in the US. So it depends from market to market. Here the option 19 inch then, you can see also in the B color scheme. The ground clearance, you see it's, you know, it's not really an SUV, but it's not a normal vehicle, it is a crossover. So the total ground clearance is 21 centimeters, and that's six centimeters higher than a normal S90 or V90. And the cross country is just reserved for the estate, or the Combi as we say in Germany. So you always have a V90 cross country right there. You know that in the midsize segment, they already have now, we present you the, uh, that one last year, an S60 cross country. So they did have this before this idea to put it in the sedan, but I'm not sure at the moment I haven't heard that it would come for the sedan and you know the estate is a more versatile one anyway. One thing I do criticize about this overall I mean I think it's a really great look so it fits the vehicle has something you know some more spice to it but I'm not sure you know about this split here to don't have you know the classic round stru structure here that it's split maybe if they would have put it a little bit you know, a little bit smaller then I wouldn't have needed to extend it over the door. This looks a little bit strange, doesn't it? But what do you think? Would you go for this crossover look or rather for a normal one? With the review with AJ, you've also seen that you can paint this one here in normal vehicle color. But then the question would be, why would you go for the cross country then? So if you go for the CC, I would pick it in that way. Vertical taillights as we used from SUVs or estates by Volvo. Then the round shape here, you do lose some height in the trunk. This is for design purposes. You know it has been different with older estates from Volvo. This is a fight design versus interior room. The cross country features this plastic strap here right there with the stamped logo right in there. It looks still quite fancy. So this is to round up the whole CC design and fake exhaust tips, four cylinder engines, they do not have big exhaust tips and so this is the design decision they have taken.
is the Volvo key. And you can also have a keyless entry. Put your hand right there and side mirrors and the door close. Put your hand there and everything opens. Nicely done. Then, I love that Scandinavian matte wood style. Feels great, looks great. Then you see, um, you know, this structure here is a good idea, I think. It's also a little bit soft and a good structure, but you should also keep it clean that it um, looks class. Then the optional Bowers and Wilkins sound system is mounted in here. It has a great sound, one of the best, together with the 3D sound in their Mercedes E-Class. If you put that on this uh, Gothenburg um, uh, orchestra scheme. Then, well, for big bottles, not the best one here, so rather slim, but you see here for sunglass cases, this works. Then you have a lot of interior equipment. PDC, ACC, AC, seat heating, and the infotainment system you see. Wait a minute, what about those abbreviations? Adaptive cruise control, air conditioning, and park distance control. <laughs> That's what behind. So, a lot of extra equipment here included already in the, in the cross-country variant and sadly also always comes with animal skin. The seat form is good, great for comfort. But Volvo should offer more alternative, especially also here in the high trims, which the cross-country also is. Then let's get inside. It's a little bit higher, as I said earlier. Um, that makes it a little bit easier to get inside and outside. Why not? Seating comfort is the same, however, as in the S90 or in the V90, as the seats are also identically the same. Um, you can adjust a lot of things electronically, so also this front area, but then that would all be done here with the electric seats. The steering wheel can be adjusted manually, like this. It's a good and smooth function. Um, I really love the overall design, but I think the steering wheel in those new Volvos in comparison to the rest of the design, looks a little bit clumsy, you know, with this, you know, I don't know, square with rounded shapes on the uh, on the edges, and then you know those those buttons here. This is, I think, the only thing they should improve in the interior. The rest is actually totally fine to me. Then let's take a detailed look at the cockpit overview, instruments, and infotainment system. Let's go. So this is the cockpit overview, here again with this interesting structure they put on there. So it's a good idea that you don't have to use animal skin there, but they could also use leatherette. For example, in the XC60, in the new one, you can get a leatherette package for the dashboard, which looked quite fancy. Here again, the matte wood is being used. I really love that. Horizontal chrome span, everything is centered around this infotainment system. There is also a very base model of the S90 and the V90, which does not come with that, but most of them automatically come with those as soon as you pick a little bit uh, higher trim. Soon more to that. All of the buttons are gone. Climate control is also just when you go right there. So you um, I can turn the vehicle on for that. So and yet you go like this. Um, there's no really knob for that, and sometimes I do miss that. The only knob is here for the sound to... to turn it and then the mandatory buttons which you really would need for example for the warning triangle right there. Automatic gearbox we have here and then those covers in the lower part you can also retract but as they also are quite fancy let's take a detailed look at them also quite soon. Instruments in the higher trim level is with this bigger digital instrument screen so you can see the difference here when I start the vehicle and in the middle Part, we have some smaller infotainment screen where we can also see something different. You can have consumption information right there, for example, or radio information in the middle one. And overall, it does a good job, but I think I have seen better digital displays, I have to admit. So the infotainment unit, here you can zoom around in the map where we have the GPS, also works pretty fast, it's nice. You can also have the 3D view that you have you know, a little bit more perspective in there. Other than that, let's go to the home screen where you can have, for example, a radio, phone, you can connect via Bluetooth, or also you can plug it in and then use um, the, the mirroring functions, consumption information like this, and then everything else for options, you go there, left side for, for example, 
putting an infotainment uh, system option for the assistant systems or the camp temporary unavailable. Let's turn the car on. Here we go. So this is surround view. Really looks quite fancy. Good resolutions. But you can also only pick, for example, the rear view camera. So you can really adjust it or go back to the 360 view. And you really need that with that vehicle. Other than that, on the right side would be some more options. Um, but most of the time, you really remain in the main menu. And if you hold the button, you get in this cleaning mode. Then you can like clean everything with a microfiber tissue and nothing happens. Or you could also just turn off the car and then do this, do this stuff. So, there's nice metal wood covers here again. For example, you could put the key right there and here. You can have the beverage holders, they are adaptive, or you can just, for example, put a basement garage beeper in there. But a nice crystal design for the start and stop engine button. I remember it used to be in the you know, early XC90s that you can put it left and right, but now they've put it that everything just goes right for start and stop. Driving mode selector also in the crystal look. I'll talk more about the driving modes when we drive the vehicle. Electric handbrake. And then Good build quality here also with the cover of the armrest. You can put the smartphone in there. Uh, USB with two slots, one just to charge and one for the uh, smartphone mirroring connection. So let's take a look at the panoramic roof. There's this shade firstly available. And wow, it goes really over the whole vehicle. Takes some time though. And at the same time we can open it up like this. Wow, oh, it really leaves a lot of light. So this is the maximum solution here. Why not? I mean, the only thing is, if you want more headroom available, then you could leave it out. I'm 1 meters 86 or 6 foot 1. And well, here it does work for sure. It would be a little bit easier if we do not have the panoramic roof, but it works for me. So it will work for, for most people. Let's also try it in the rear. So let's get in the rear. You can see that the rear window does not go down all the way, but you can also see the sound insulation that they have this double layer glass. And you can also put a sunshade up right there, manual. It's a little bit tricky. There we go. So and then let's get inside to check the leg room. And as I would be driving, we still have plenty left. Um, we, I think we scored the same results with the uh, E-Class or with the BMW 5 Series. Those upper mid-size segment vehicles, I mean, they have enough legroom for tall people. But then if you think about that, some small cars, which are great in interior space, already have equal results and some have even worse results. I mean, it's not really special to have such legroom with five meters or over six in foot in length. But then, you know, if you have that vehicle, you'll be fine with at least four adults in the rear. Headroom wise, for me, there's also still some space left. However, again, if you do not pick the panoramic roof, you have a little bit more flexibility in this case. And the armrest, this features some cup holders right there. You can also use a ski hatch, uh, which you open from the trunk. And you also have optionally then climate control for the rear seats and also putting in a rear cable right there. And next to ISOFIX on the outside seats, tri seat anchor points, there's also this funny function when you do not need the real whole child seat anymore. You just need you know, this, um, this little box you put, put uh, on the seat, for example. You can save that and use, just use the internal system, not only for, uh, for this height, um, if you need a little bit more, you can push, push another button in the front. It's a little bit tricky here, like this. And then you can put it even a little bit higher, like this. So, great innovative idea to have a very elegant inbuilt child seat system. Not for the very small ones, for, but for the, let's say, middle-aged uh, children. And well, put it down like this again. Engines, what do we have? 
the D4 diesel with 190 horsepower or this one here today the D5 with 235 horsepower or petrol engines T5 254 horsepower or T6 320 horsepower. In the cross country they always come with all wheel drive but so far limited engine picks and they are all 2 liter displacement and 4 cylinder engines, no others available. Now the driving part. I have activated the seat massage. So I'm pretty relaxed and it works very well by the way, while driving especially. Also goes to the high shoulders, so nice option to have. It is comparable to the seat massage function in the Mercedes E-Class. With the D5, as we told you earlier, it can be somewhat compared to the T5, so there's not really so much difference in driving. All are four-cylinder engines and they also come very close in performance. It's just that the diesel consume way less, but on the other hand, the petrol engines are a little bit more fun to ride. But again, not a big difference between those. Rolling with 100 kilometers an hour is really relaxing, not only because of the seat massage, the sound insulation is really great. I think the E-Class in this segment here, upper mid-size, is the best one as for sound insulation. If you go for this optional sound insulation package, same accounts for the BMW 5 Series. The Audi A6 will be updated at some point. At the moment, cannot catch up some with the insulation wise with the new 5 Series or the new E-Class. But this one here also at the very high level for sure. You know, we have the air suspension in the S or V90 moments just at the rear axle. You do feel somewhat a difference to a car where it is on both axles. But still, it's really comfortable. The overall suspension, a good ride. Very well to control the vehicle. Although this one here sits six centimeters higher, the crossover variant, you do not feel that you would be driving an SUV. It is a notable difference to the S90 or the V90, the normal versions each. So you do feel a difference. Oh, F-Pace customer vehicles. I haven't seen that lately. So it is indeed somewhat a crossover. You have something of a SUV a little bit, but something of a normal car, but still more towards the normal car area. For example, in city traffic, maybe, I'm not sure if you hear it on microphone with this, that's the seat massage that is active. <laughs> so uh, the overview is to the rear very good, especially as it's an estate form to the sides. Well, the windows have a little curve and they are very small for design reasons, so that's not the best overview. And to the front, the overview really could be better. I mean, when you're driving, it's not such a problem, but when you may be going in the basement garage, searching for a parking spot, it's really like a ship, you know, you steer around the ship, you can really see, ah, where is it ending now in the front? So there are a lot of situations where without this surround view camera system, which is then again optional, you would be... Where is that guy going? Um, you would be pretty much lost. So I would really recommend to go for the camera system. This is one of the most important features. There's an adaptive cruise control available, but also this pilot assist, so that would be the next step for part autonomous driving and now also working up to higher speeds I think 130 kilometers this is really handy in city traffic how that really plays out I've already shown in the recent Volvo XC60 the all new SUV in that review so we were in the traffic jam there and the vehicle was really handling it very well I could take everything or also hands off the steam wheel 
accelerating and stuff. So everything was done by the vehicle. It was really relaxing when you are in city traffic. In normal, you know, if you have the pilot assist mount, you know, then even if you're not supposed to still keep your hands at the steering wheel, you always have this low, very little con con correcting commands. You feel it, and it can be a little bit distracting. So when you rather driving yourself, then I would just go with the normal depth of cruise control. You click, click left here for normal cruise control, right for the pilot assist. Normal depth of cruise control does not do anything with the steering, but just with accelerating and keeping the distance to the car in front of you. And well, the systems at Volvo, those assistance systems are really very well tuned. So, at the moment we also have the blind spot monitor active on the right side, but I'll soon switch over to the right lane that you can also show it on the left side. So, now look at the side mirror that's coming. Yeah, you are some great, yeah, SQ5, putting it out, the SQ5 diesel. It's like, oh my god, I have to wait one second behind another car and then I have to let all my aggression out to really hammer the throttle. That's how people are. So setting the normal cruise control now to 70. Again, such a relaxing ride here. That you sit a little bit more upright is also quite nice. Why not? So if you think, ah, you know, I'm not that SUV guy, but a little bit more upright, why not? And I have this great summer house in the countryside where there's a harsh gravel road. I'm approaching it. Then you might need this crossover with a little bit more off-road capability or off-road flexibility. Then again, this test vehicle is overall at 86,000 euros. I'm not sure if I want to put that off-road too much of the time. But I think the relaxing factor is, is the main thing about this vehicle. So great to relax. And you have such a calm ride with the sound insulation, with a great suspension, soft steering, the steam is actually really laid out rather to relax you because, well, you have sometimes to steer a little bit too much, I think, and if you expect a sporty dynamic ride, it will not serve your needs. So it's rather indirect, not very sporty at all. So if you compare the other vehicles in the segment, this one here rather moves away from the sporty approach, more in the luxury approach. I would rather compare it with the driving feeling of the Mercedes E-Class, the BMW 5 Series, also the Audi A6, rather go in a sportier direction. However, you can also go with the driving modes. For example, there's an Eco driving mode. That one then is good for reducing throttle input just a little bit, also to let the car roll, or sailing or coasting function, however you want to call it, that you save some fuel. And then there's the dynamic mode. Throttle input is increased, shifting up later, shifting down earlier. And in this dynamic mode, let's accelerate from 70 to 100. See what it comes to. Oh, there we go. So you see this D5 diesel does a good job in performance. It's also not too loud. Now on the motorway, let's go with the pilot assist again to have this semi-autonomous function. And now the, see the cars queue up a little bit, speed is reduced, I'm doing nothing. And also the steering wheel keeps me in the lane now. Again, it's not yet meant to take your hands off the steering wheel. This is now just for demonstration purposes and there's no one behind me. I'm keeping it in control. Now the car tells me, Evil Thomas, please overtake the steering wheel again. Of course, I'm obeying. Mr. Vehicle. So for now that's the way it is, but it can assist you. That's also why it's called pilot assist. So you keep your hands on the steering wheel basically and you get a little bit help that it's maybe more relaxing to drive. Again, I think the best solution to go for that at the moment to to have it, you know, in, in, in traffic situations that is really helpful because otherwise those traffic situations can be really annoying you know again this discipline here on the motorway really well done 
and the total consumption here in our test rides we had over the past days is something above or close to 7 liters on 100 kilometers. Considering the size of the vehicle it's okay, however for example with the BMW 5 series, the new one, those 3 liter 6 cylinder diesels, they have bigger displacement at the same time they consume here. Here for example, you know, when you push this car in the corner now with a little higher speed, it's not even in the dynamic mode. Well, you have a little bit different steering feeling then, but this vehicle is not like you push it in the corner and you say, ah, you know, I have a lot of fun doing that. That's rather, for example, with the 5 Series. So this one here is more a vehicle to enjoy if you really, especially in this cross-country um, version, to enjoy the calmness and the luxury of riding and I think it's also not a bad decision it always depends on what the customer wants so I would never say that a car is better or worse because it's sportier or not sportier it always depends on what do you especially expect of a vehicle so decide yeah <laughs> However, you know, it works well that you can see switch around the car a little bit, go some slalom. It's tilting a little bit. You're sliding also a little bit on the leather seats. That's another problem driving sporty with this vehicle. As I said earlier, only available with animal skin. Well, Tesla has, Tesla has recently banned all leather from its vehicles. And Volvo is still claiming to be the eco brand. But they're totally forgetting about this issue yet. But that will change. They have to, because customer otherwise won't agree to it anymore. Let's see if the slalom is any different in the normal comfort mode. The steering wheel feels a little bit lighter then. Um, so the steering characteristic is the one that has the biggest impact with this driving mode change. Other than that, there isn't a big difference between those driving modes. So I think the steering wheel is really the biggest difference and that the shifting characteristic is, is changed a little bit. So if you want a little bit sportier shifting, a little bit more RPM, for example, on the motorway, when you want to overtake someone, for example. Another solution would be also to go into the manual shifting mode, putting the automatic shifting lever to the left side. And then you can manually shift down, for example, push it to shift up, pull it to shift down. Does it make any sense? I think not. Or what, what do you think? I would rather pull and shift upwards and push and shift downwards. That's what, what I would expect. I'm not sure why they did it the other way around. Anyways, this function is, well, it's not so sporty to drive. It's rather when you, for example, going in the Alps and you're driving downhill for a very long time and you want to use the engine brake and with a manual gearbox that's no problem at all you can always adjust it but here also no problem with the automatic gearbox you can then just shift down again yourself and use the engine brake also while going downhill we had some discussion after AJ's video about the V90 cross-country about the automatic gearbox and I can just assure you again I mean Volvo is telling that themselves there is no such thing as the dual clutch transmission in those new models here so it is a converter automatic gearbox different technology in automatic gearboxes if you haven't heard of those because someone was insisting that it should be a dual clutch transmission in there and it's just not we don't have to discuss it Volvo says it officially, it's not happening. So, a lot of different driving situations and information, and again, main characteristic, such a relaxing ride. Uh, one of the most comfortable cars in this segment. Overall also, you know, especially long-term driving is nothing to this vehicle. Volvo always has great comfort seats, letting the services now aside but from the seat form and from the comfort they offer, always a very good result by those. 
one last remark here about the steering wheel. Um, it's a little bit strange again. I'm not sure if it's also due to the, the chemicals that they use and because it's new. But when you're driving it for a longer time and you have this, you know, small, almost like residues on your hands. And it, it makes your hands dry somewhat. I'm not sure what, what it... Oh, that's interesting. I'm not sure what it is actually, but I don't like it. What happened actually right now was... Um, I'm not, maybe it was because I was driving over the middle line, but it was maybe basically an emergency braking warning. So the car was braking a little bit. Uh, when I have Volvo test vehicles, and I have really had them like one or two weeks, something like this basically always happens. So you have, you know, in one or two weeks at least, one or two experiences where the assistance systems overdo something. And in some situation you, you know, maybe get surprised a little bit because there's something's, you know, there's a sudden beep or a sudden small braking maneuver and that does happen, yeah. However, maybe it's better this way around that it sometimes overreacts and then at no point it underreacts. So that would be, I think, um, the even worse point, wouldn't it? So I hope you enjoyed our driving impression here for today. And now to our conclusion, Volvo V90 Cross Country. For sure, great and spicy, I would call it, in design. Exterior both and interior with the Scandinavian touch. Lacking of the animal skin alternatives, as we know with so many other manufacturers going that way now, Volvo has to do that too. But the comfort from the seating position is already really great. And also everything we see from a building processing quality is also very nice. The driving is very relaxing, so much comfort you have there for sure. The only thing is sometimes it feels a little bit bulky if you want a sporty driving experience that might not be the best thing for you even in the sport mode. Others can do better there. If you're focusing on comfort, you're exactly right by that. And here also then in the CC with more ground clearance. Now I would like to hear your feedback on this very vehicle. Would you go for this one? And the total price, you know, this one here starts at about 55,000 euros with the D5 above 60. And then with all the equipment we've shown here today, that's always a problem with the Volvo Extras, 86,000 euros, that's again too expensive. I think you should maybe leave it with the base model then, which already comes with a lot of stuff you will possibly need. Thank you so much for tuning in and also see you next time at Aundagwil.